Hey, hey, it's Shay Keister, and I'm your host and the founder of Casual Cattle Conversations, a global rancher education company that strives to bring honest thoughts and conversations from ranchers and leaders to other ranchers. Be sure to follow Cattle Convos on social media to have more in-depth conversations around the ranching business and lifestyle brought to you. If you are ready to take your operation to the next level and improve your lifestyle too, send me a message about my Rancher Mind group. Rancher Minds are monthly roundtable discussions for ranchers to learn from peers and experts and leave the call with actionable advice to make changes on their own operations. With that, let's see who our guest is today and what experience and advice they have to offer you to improve your own operation. Alrighty. Well, thanks for hopping on the show today. I am excited to have you on here because you've been following along, at least on social media for a while. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So just to start off kind of like I do with every listener, I mean, it's fun. I haven't really done like a fan feature yet, but you know, would you just really share your background in ranching and how you got started? I got started really as a kid, just with uh, subsistence agriculture. You know, we had a big garden, we had some cattle, um, chickens, and we did a little bit of trading, I guess you might say with family members, as far as, um, tomato plants out of, the, out of the garden or out of the uh, greenhouse, excuse me. And then we always butchered a calf and maybe even a pig here and there as a, as just for our own consumption, you know. And then in 2013, I ventured off on my own and started my own little deal and started selling beef to customers, just halves. Um, and then it's now progressed to a, a retail uh, option to include, you know, supplying some, supplying some restaurants with some retail beef. Well, that's really neat. And I think, you know, that's really a big push right now is that direct to consumer and even like sourcing to restaurants. So it's cool Mm -hmm. to see you do that. What really, you know, you said in 2013, you kind of started your own operation. What really pushed you to start doing your own thing? Uh, As is often the case, sometimes families don't really see eye to eye. And that was the case then. And um, rather than uh, try to continue to fight uh, verbally, obviously with, uh, with family, I just went off on my own. And, uh, if I was controlling my stuff, then I could make the decisions for the direction of my program. We like to use that word program. Well, awesome. So what is that program today? Do you want to talk a little bit more in depth about what that looks like outside of, uh, sourcing beef to restaurants and selling halves to consumers? Sure. I, I have a seed stock program, so I'm, I'm more, primarily focused on selling breeding bulls and even if necessary breeding females to commercial uh, operators as is always the case you're going to have animals that call themselves either because they're not good enough to be a breeding bull or they're they're a female that won't breed or she won't breed back or you have other issues you're just if you're if you're a progressive breeder you're going to make those decisions and it's nice when you can capitalize on those animals that would otherwise just bring you a commercial value price that you know whatever's going at the local sale barn and you can capitalize on those, uh, on those animals and really keep the, keep the economy funded here in the, in the local areas. And everyone can do that. Not just here in central Texas. Well, that's awesome. So is there like a specific breed you're uh, fond of or what does that look like for you? Yes. I'm a registered beef master breeder. Okay. Beef master breeders United. Sorry. I didn't really go into that earlier. Hey, that's just fine. I was just curious. So Kind of hopping into another side of your story that kind of makes, you know, part of your story unique is, so you're an amputee and so you share some unique challenges there. Would you kind of talk about that story and really how that's impacted your view of ranching? Well, it's definitely made things a little harder. Uh, In the words of Temple Grandin, my life is different, but not less. I may not be able to do things exactly the way I did it but I can certainly still accomplish just about everything I was doing um, before. I'm not going to take a run and start and jump over a fence anymore, but who the heck needs to do that anyway? (laughs) But it it definitely made me more conscious of doing stuff, I guess, the easier way and, or excuse me, the the more efficient way uh, as far as physical limitations and certainly to really just kind of keep it simple, stupid. And that's talking about me now as the, as the stupid, stupid one. 
<laughs> well, it's, it's awesome to see that you, um, are still living your dream and, uh, really, you know, maybe inspiring others to do the same. So looking at, you know, you said you're in central Texas. So can you talk about the challenges you face ranching in that area, or maybe what agriculture looks like in that area? Because I know you and I have talked before on the phone and kind of talked about urbanization and uh, some of those challenges. So what's your perspective on being a rancher in central Texas? Well, as has been agriculture's theme, we have to adapt. Um, challenges present themselves both environmentally and economically and just all around. So we have to adapt. And one way to adapt to this urban sprawl that's going on is you have to, you have to find ways to continue to produce efficiently, but even we have to go even more efficient now, um, utilizing cover crops and um, just being okay having smaller herd sizes, smaller contemporary groups with, within the herds to, to make it work. You know, we can't, it's hard to find land around here, so you have to make use of what you got. And if all you have is a 47 acre lease, well, you cross fence and you fertilize and weed spray and um, try to do some cover crops and, and stuff like that, just to try to maximize the square footage uh, that you've got. Are cover crops something you've implemented personally then? Uh, at the direction of someone that's smarter than I am. I, I don't make a habit of ignoring people that are smarter than I am. And there's a soil scientist that lives close by and uh, that's Liz Haney. I'll shout out, hey, Liz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> her and her husband, Rick, are both soil science scientists. And uh, at her direction, she probably doesn't know this, but I've, I've implemented some cover crops just to try to maximize the, the production value of the, the land I'm using. Well, that's awesome to hear. I know that's something that's been talked about a little more on the show and something I've been exposed to a lot in my time in Nebraska and even back home in North Dakota too, just listening to kind of some of those more professional soil scientists, as you said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So going back to how you're ranching in central Texas, you've already talked about how you kind of struggle to maybe have as much land as you'd like. So you have to get creative there because there's a lot of urban areas and you're already marketing direct to the consumer and direct to the restaurant. So would you say you have an advantage at connecting to the consumer because of where you live and that, you know, that's actually powerful for agriculture? Oh, absolutely. There's an educational side and a marketing side, which I guess they're kind of connected People get to see firsthand how their food products, and in this case, beef, is being produced because they drive by it every day. Uh, next to one of my leases, there's a subdivision. So they, people that leave that subdivision, they drive right by a pasture full of cows and they or calves, and they get to see, hey, that's that's where Matt has his stuff, and it it gives an opportunity to reach out to consumers and even potential consumers, just to say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is why we're trying to do it. This is how we're doing it. And here's the animals. And surprisingly, even people that are not from agriculture backgrounds, they end up enjoying um, a what a friend of mine called meet your meat, which is, it's a pretty neat deal when the consumers, not only do they want local beef, but they, often, they also want to see this specific animal that they're going to be putting <laughs> in their freezer. So have you gone out of your way more than just, you know, connecting with people in the area as far as selling beef to them, as far as like being an advocate for agriculture? I mean, what does, what do your advocacy involve, what does your advocacy involvement kind of look like? How do you play that part as a rancher? Well, social media has certainly played a role and it allows you to connect with people you other, otherwise you wouldn't be able to connect. And I, I work at a feed store and we're starting to expand that the horizon or scope of that feed store to not just be a feed store to, you know, have garden plants. Of course, that's always been the case. We now have a freezer in that feed store and that and having dog food that brings people in the door and you get to engage with local with locals to uh, to kind of spread your spread spread your story. Excuse me. Well, that that's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So. Do you think, you know, from your perspective, do you believe that ranchers need to be doing more with connecting to the consumer? They certainly can be doing more. Um, whether or not they do is kind of up to them. Unfortunately, the market will correct itself or the market will dictate what the market's going to dictate. 
we have to adapt. It, there's, it's not an option in order to be successful long term, uh, both environmentally and economically. We have to adapt now. You know, we, you should be taking steps right now uh, to to be able to adapt in the future. This is a slow process. This business, agriculture itself, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, you you have to be taking steps now to to be able to maintain the long term productivity of your program. Be you a row crop farmer or a or a sheep farmer or a, or a cattle rancher, it doesn't matter. What would you say some of those steps look like then? Well, I'm I'm not as well versed on the financial side of things, uh, you know, as far, far as financial planning. But you know, take steps now to to try to avoid inheritance taxes. Um, put your cattle operation in an LLC so you can run it like a business. The the phrase, oh, we just do this as a hobby. That, that doesn't work anymore. It can work for a short time, but if we're going to, if we're going to maintain our prowess as an industry, that is the beef industry, we have to take steps now to maintain that longevity. Do you think, you know, if producers did do more of their part to share kind of on an advocacy level, or even just look at it as marketing, that that would help combat urbanization? I don't know that that single-handedly would stop or curb urban sprawl or urbanization. It would certainly bridge the gap because there's such a disconnect between the consumption and the production of, of our foods, uh, myself included. I'm not quite as connected with the people that grow my vegetables. I'm more focused on, on beef production, but I do think bridging that gap would open people's eyes to, hey, maybe we shouldn't sell Pawpaw's Farm. Maybe we should... Um, lease it out or do something that it could make it more productive than just square footage for homes. Well, that's awesome. So I'm going to shift gears here in the conversation. So in a previous conversation we've had, you were talking about thinking globally and acting locally. So can you explain mm -hmm. what you mean like that as it relates to the agriculture space and how you, you are living that out? Well, like I said before, we, we, what we do on our own program, it does affect the globe, but really it's really just going to affect what we're doing on a day-to-day -day and our local, I guess, region. We have to take steps to work together, I guess, uh, to, uh, to run our programs better. I mean, it, it's not just a simple, oh, I want to do better. We have to have a, a set, set of metrics uh, to to try to measure. We, if we can't manage it if we don't measure it. And the only way we're going to do that is by measuring our success. And it's not just, oh, I made money. I think if more ranchers were looking the people that were eating their product in the eye, I think it would, it would increase a little bit of accountability and not only boost the local economy, but it would, it would just encourage others to become more vested in agriculture and not just going to the grocery store, open up a cooler and get in a package. What do you mean by increase accountability? Can you expand on that? Well, when the consumer that's eating your product it lives a few doors down, you're going to hear about, um, hey, this was this tasted like this, or hey, I bought some ground meat from you and it was a little fattier than I thought it would be, or this was this, or you know, any any time we go to a grocery store, all all we can do is just go take it, take the product back to the grocery store and say, hey, this happened, or. This, this packaging was damaged. Whenever, whenever you're looking your con the consumer in the eye, you're gonna have feedback, good and bad, and you can either you know, wallow in that criticism or you can try to do better. And that, that includes finding a better butcher, finding a better feed program, doing something different in your, in your cow herd on the cow calf side or on the backgrounding side. All of those things, they, all they do is make us better. They make us better. So how do you view that accountability then on like, like that you have that accountability from the standpoint of you are selling direct to consumers, but mm -hmm. where do you think that can play in for those who aren't selling direct to consumers? I would just open it up as an option for them. I think too many consumers or too many producers, excuse me, just think, oh, there's no way I could do that. And it's really not as difficult as it is if they already are set up as a cow calf operation or even as a backgrounding operation to, to try to do that. Um, I think it's breaking down some of those preconceived notions that we have about 
oh, well, I'm, I, I can't afford to feed these animals. I just need to take them to the sale barn. I started very small selling the majority of my animals to the sale barn and just keeping one or two back each year to try to try to butcher for personal consumption and then for friends and family. And once it expanded, the, the demand expanded, I had to find a place where I could kill uh, animals under a USDA inspection to try to sell inspected meat. And that's how it starts. Um, all it takes is one. Uh, most of these guys are and guys and girls are they're already um, they're already butchering their own meat anyway, and they're just eating it at home. So they've already done it. That's really the, the that they've really already taken the steps necessary. They just need to reach out to some to some friends that they want to sell their beef to. Maybe develop a set feeding program and find a place to kill that's inspected, and, and boom, there you go. Now we're sizzling. I appreciate you making that point that when we're, you know, having our own animals harvested to come back and feed ourselves, we are already selling to the consumer because we are the consumer too. And sometimes I think we forget to say that, you know, remind ourselves that yes, we're the producer, but we're also a producer and a consumer of the product we raise. Yes. And we're, we're also a business. And when it gets down to it, there's a lot of unrealized gains and potential as far as the, the financial side that you're just, you're just giving away in the, in just the cow calf side, if you wean your calves and, and background them just a little bit, you've already added value that sometimes you don't get compensated for on at the, at the sale barn. But it, then if you just keep them a little bit longer to, to add a little bit of weight to them, put some fat cover on them. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to have a finished animal with the commercial industry calls a finished animal if you've got a pretty good weaning weights you're not that far off from the harvest weight and right there you've got a product ready to sell that has incredible value to both you to the consumer and to the local economy because that money stays here and it doesn't go up to the panhandle or, or kansas or nebraska not that that's a bad thing can commercially produced beef and conventional conventional beef production is is a great thing it's a well-oiled machine there are just different ways to do it. And this is just one way. Well, I appreciate you sharing your perspective on that and really looking at the industry as a whole. So as we kind of wrap up today, you know, one of those final questions that I, I love to ask a mindset question to every one of my guests. Mm -hmm. So what mindset change do you think we need to have when it comes to the beef industry? That's a pretty tough one. I would say definitely sustainability from a production and environmental standpoint, and also from a marketing standpoint, I guess, an economical standpoint and just bridging that gap. That's so huge. It, it, when you can talk to the people that are consuming your product, it will, it will spur something in your head that you, Hey, you know what? I could do this. And I talk to people weekly and it's, you can see the wheels turning like, wait, I could do that. Oh, well, I didn't know that. And right there, you have another local beef producer that I, I see in the future as operating almost as co-ops maybe where people are feeding into a feeding program that is local, butchered local, marketed local, and it just stays within each specific region. Um, but that may be pie in the sky. I, I hope that's where it goes. Um, just don't settle. That's another big thing. People just assume, okay, well, you know, Papa, I use Papa because I had a Papa. Papa did it like this, so this is the way we're going to do it. Papa did it like this. Daddy did it like this. That's that's how we're going to do it. Don't settle for that status quo. A, a buddy of mine that runs our our seed stock marketing program, he he always says, "Don't settle for the status quo." And and it's so true. Just because it was working in 1995 doesn't mean it's working in 2022, and it doesn't mean it's going to work in 2035. If we're gonna if we're gonna you know lead into the lead the charge into the horizon of whatever whatever this world comes or whatever this world brings we're going to have to do better and not settle for sale barn prices or don't settle for oh well that's that's what my buyer gives me that's what you know from xyz cattle auction or cattle marketing that's what they give me so that's just what i've got to take no it's not no it's not do you have options out there and it, all it's going to do is make you better it's going to make your cattle better it's going to make your program better and it's going to make the local economy better. And you may have a business on your hands you didn't even know about. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate your 
perspective today, do you have any final thoughts um, or perspectives you'd like to share before we wrap up? Um, ex- I would say just expand on what people are doing right. We, we hear all the time what we're doing wrong, um, especially in the, in the beef world. Um, we have to be willing to admit where we can improve and actively take steps to do so. We, we, you have to set goals. It's not just laissez-faire. We're going to put a bull out there and some cows and, or buy, buy, a few black, uh, buy a few black calves and feed them out and be done with it. Set specific goals that benefit both the beef industry as a whole and each individual program. And I guess we'll just see where we go. I, 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 I'm hopeful for the future of beef, even in an area where I'm experiencing tons of urban sprawl. I'm, I'm still hopeful. That's exciting. Thank you very much for joining me today. It was great to have you on here. Yes, ma'am. Thanks so much. And that's a wrap on that one. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the episode. And if you have any further questions around the topic, take care and have a great day.